Hey, before we get started, I wanted to let you know that this episode is brought to you by The Restless Store. If you haven't already, you can go to therestlesspodcast.com and click on the store tab to find all of the restless swag you have wanted, with more being added all the time. You've heard us mention shirt ideas on the show, and now you can own them. Restless logo shirt, Women Need Pastors 2, Ecclesiology Matters, and now available for the very first time, the Nuance shirt. Do you always pick Nuance? Well, then this is the shirt for you. Once again, to support the show, go to therestlesspodcast.com, visit the store tab, and get yourself something neat. This is Restless. Welcome back to Restless, a post-mortem on the young, restless, and reformed. I'm your host, Matt, joined by Pastor Michael. But this is Restless Summer, where we kind of do whatever we want. That's we right. Talk. We do all kinds of fun stuff. Right. We, we usually in the summer, we talk to people. We do interviews about things that sound interesting to us. And um, that really is the biggest reason we talk to people is <laughs> because we want to use the platform we have to get us in a conversation with people that we like and want to talk to. So, so that's so, what we do. So thank you listener for making that possible for giving yes. us an excuse to talk to interesting people. And so today is no exception as we are, we have Matthew Hoskin from the Davenant Institute joining us. And I'm hoping I got that last name, right? Matt, welcome to restless. Great. Yes. Thanks very much, Matt. And yes, my last name is Hoskin. So. Great. Well, <clears throat> we're excited to talk about your the upcoming course you're teaching at the Davenant Institute, which, if I'm correct, our listeners could enroll in or audit um, uh, from a distance uh, if they want. Is that right? That's right. I actually have students as far afield as Australia. Wow. Um, yeah. So Hey, we've got like, Australian listeners, so... Shout there out we go. to you well, guys. You come. <laughs> That's right. Well, Matt, tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll talk more about uh, the class and we'll, we'll, we'll get into the topic of today's interview. All right. Well, um, professionally speaking, I have a PhD from the University of Edinburgh um, in church history and classics. So the stuff I sort of am trained in is looking at the church fathers, looking at ancient Christian texts, but sort of initially, sort of from the perspective of classical history, um, ancient history, the Roman empire, and also philology, um, the study of the Latin language and all of those sorts of things. So, and I recently had a big book, like a 500 page book published. So sort of like my big exciting news um, about Pope Leo the Great who was Bishop of Rome from 440 to 461 and the transmission of his letters throughout the Middle Ages. So that's sort of my, that's like my PhD background, but I've yeah. also always had, since I was an undergrad, that's not always, I suppose, since I was 20, that's not my whole life, that's just half of it. A love of monks and monkish things mm. and the Desert Fathers. But I chose to go a different route for research. But now that I'm teaching at Davenant Hall, I have the opportunity to teach about the Desert Fathers, um, who I've spent lots of time with over the years. So I'm excited to be uh, teaching that. Um, my own church background is Anglican. My dad's an Anglican minister. My brother is an Anglican minister. My uncle's a retired bishop. My granddad was an Anglican minister. My great granddad was an Anglican minister. My great great granddad was an archbishop. Wow. So, um, so yeah, so that's my own. That's a, it's a bit intense. Yeah, yeah it that's is. That's awesome. <laughs> That is awesome. And, and a lot of Anglicanism, but to our truly reformed Calvinist listeners, don't worry, we will be forcing Matt into our Calvinist mold today because he is going to tell us like we always do with our, uh, many of our guests who are going to come and tell us, talk to us about a topic like this today. It will be monkish, but we are going to learn about the five points, the five things you need to know about the desert fathers, because Upcoming, that is the class you're going to be teaching for Davenant Hall. When does that class start? That class starts in September, some, sometime mid-month, I believe. Great. I'm sorry that I don't actually know exact dates. No worries. We will post a link to Davenant Hall where you can find more information on the class uh, if you'd like to enroll after today. Um, I think 
this is a topic that I actually, uh, I'm really interested. Um, I don't know a lot about it. So I had a friend um, who he was, uh, he's now, I think he's, well, he's just graduated seminary and he was reading and he was taking an interest in um, monks and he kind of lives a bit of a monk, monkish lifestyle. I'll say he's a single guy that way. Um, and he started reading the Desert Fathers to see, to read their writings. And he said, Matt, you know what I learned after reading a collected volume of, of their writings? I said, what? He said, I think they were kind of whack. That was his uh, <laughs> one word summary of, of the Desert Fathers. And so uh, I, it's interesting uh, that that was his, uh, um, uh, his experience reading it. But Michael, what do you, uh, what do you, do you have any, do you have any baggage or interest in in this coming in? What do you what do you think when you hear the Desert Fathers? You know, I really I'm this is an area that I feel like I, I don't know um, that much about. I don't know. You know, my seminary training was it. It was well known that uh, at Trinity when I was there, that there was just nobody really teaching on the fathers at all. Um, and I've always been interested in you know, the first uh, couple of centuries of the church and have spent, uh, you know, a fair amount of time reading uh, some of the early fathers, but I have not spent a lot of time with the desert fathers. So I'm, I feel like I'm coming in here pretty fresh. Um, you know, the interaction I feel like I've had with the desert fathers is through just the writing of some others and their interactions. And so, mm. I don't, you know, it's, it's very uh, secondhand. Well, you know, as the church began so long ago with Billy Graham, you know, it's hard to remember things that happened, uh, <laughs> in the before but no who, i think this, who could even remember anything before rick warren <laughs> <laughs> i think this is but so i think this is a really no i think it is a great subject um and i do think this is the kind of course um that i think i know this is one of the things michael you have what you love about davenant is the recovery of all of these kinds of classical sources these historic sources from across the christian tradition and i know that's one of the one of the reasons we we got connected with Colin, and now we're here with Matt. So, um, Matt, I guess without further ado, we will let you uh, correct my misconception that the Desert Fathers are a little whack, and uh, <laughs> tell us five things uh, we should uh, we should know about them. All right. Well, as an added bonus, there was once a Desert Father who crossed the Nile on a crocodile. So, I mean, well, that as our sixth thing you need to know about the Desert oh, Fathers. Oh, that was, that was for whack. free. <laughs> Number five yeah, with a bullet. Just for free. Yeah. So uh, I sort of thought that perhaps the most important thing, because they're not so well known, although I think they should be better known um, amongst the reformed world, uh, is who on earth these guys are. Sort mm. of uh, my notes have the word TARDIS written down, time and relative dimension in space. So, um, so the Desert Fathers that I'm going to be teaching about are a bunch of people who decided to go move into the wilderness around the Nile River, um, situated in a few different places, as well as um, what we would call the Judean countryside, um, and then also various parts of Syria. Um, but Syria in ancient terms is like an enormous thing that stretches into Iraq. So <laughs> yeah. various parts of Syria, um, you, tend, you tend to actually divide, you have like sort of the Egyptian Judean group and then the Syrian guys because well, there are ling linguistic difficulties and then terrain is different and the history is somewhat different as well. So, and they'd sort of start moving around in this, a special new way, we'll say, around the same time that Constantine is converted. So that's sort of who and where they are, um, but they're living a monkish life. They're often thought of as the first monks. And uh, to get into more about that, we'll start covering my other four points, I guess. Um, the only other thing about who and when and where they are is um, you sort of learn about them through things called the sayings of the Desert Fathers right. um, or sets these saints' lives about them, some of which are written by like people who knew them, some of which are written way later. And they, the greater the distance between the Desert Father and the guy writing his life, the more whack it gets. <laughs> sure. <laughs> weird. That. Yeah, weird. Um, <laughs> these guys, but some of these guys were even their own lifetimes. They were doing weird stuff. Yeah. Um, as well as letters that they wrote. And, and then we have a few sermons from this one famous abbot named Shanuti, who was like Shanuti the Great, as well as a few monastic- Killer people. name, absolutely killer name. Killer name, right? I mean, these, the guys with the, like, the authentic Egyptian 
uh, names, you're like, yeah, you just really, you really feel it there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so probably the most famous desert father is St. Anthony, correct? Is, does, and is he part of this group that you're talking about or is, is he not a participant in it? He is sort of the progenitor okay. of this group. Um, so in fact, in my class, we'll be reading the life of St. Anthony as written by St. Athanasius. Great. Um, I squeeze that into everywhere. I'm teaching, teaching Athanasius at the time right now. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've slipped that in there. Then I'm gonna do it again in the fall. I'll just, you know, there are some texts that I'm like, if I can slip this into a syllabus, I want my students to read it. Right. Yeah. So yeah, well, starting, starting with Antony, because he is the, what we think, he's like the reputed or purported mm -hmm. first monk. Um, there, there are ways where you can parse down what is a monk, what is a monastery, and how are people using these words before him in sort of mm. anti, ante, pre Nicene Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, Greg Peters, who teaches at Biola, has a great book called The Monkhood of All Believers that gets into that question. And he asks, well, what is a monk? Hmm. Or could we, are, are perhaps, perhaps we could all be monks in hmm. the sense of being monomaniacs for God. And how were people before Antony using the word? So interesting. Um, I don't want to jump if, if this is one of the things we should know about them. Uh, but um, do you want to tell our listeners a little bit about maybe the, and tell me if this is one about the phenomenon that was going around on around the time of Constantine's conversion that kind of caused the growth of, of monasticism and the, the desert fathers to go into the, the world, the Egyptian and Judean wilderness, or is that a, is that one of the things? No, we, we can get into that. Yeah. Cause I okay, only have yeah, five things tell... I can talk about. I know. So, well, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep asking questions, but yeah, we'll I wanna, cheat a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So just well. tell me a little bit about. Um, yeah, just tell us a little about like this. What you know? What is going on that causes you know a group of of Christians, right? Of Christians, um, and to kind of retreat into the wilderness at this time. So yeah. So one of the things that we sort of when we look back and say why now, mm -hmm. um, is actually the conversion of Constantine. Um, if you think about Christianity before Constantine, um, our faith was a very tightly controlled movement. Right. You, uh, you couldn't just come to church. There were no seeker friendly services. In fact, yeah. some churches had deacons who were basically bouncers and mm -hmm. they wouldn't let anyone, who, anyone they didn't recognize through the doors on Sunday morning. Wow. Yeah. Um, and you had to, before you could enroll as a catechumen, you had to like prove yourself to them at a certain level. And then once you're catechumen, that's a person who's converted but not yet baptized, you go through like a year or two of special instruction and improve, improvement in life and morals. Mm. And during that time, you're not allowed to witness an entire church service. You get kicked out. Mm -hmm. And in fact, to this day, if you go to Eastern Orthodox Church, to the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, the deacon will yell, the doors, the doors, because that's the point in the liturgy when any catechumens or hearers or anyone else would be ushered out and the doors would be shut. Mm. So they don't do that. I've sat through an entire Orthodox liturgy before. They've never, they've, the deacons have yet to manhandle it, <laughs> but sort of that's, a, it's this like liturgical relic from the age before Constantine when you were, a, we were like 10% yeah. of the Roman empire. After Constantine, um, you start getting converts. Um, and more and more people sort of surrendering themselves to the church and the discipline of the church, but in sort of, how should we put it, quick, quick succession, quick numbers. Yeah. Um, there are actually articles tracing, you can, can't really trace the lower class because they leave behind no textual record, but the upper classes are like, they just ski jump um, mm -hmm. throughout the fourth century so that by 400, there are almost no professing pagans left. Wow. So, I mean, there are still some people like Symmachus anyway, that's a different story, but like, they're just quickly because you gain everyone. If you're a Roman aristocrat, you want to be cozy with the emperor. If the emperor takes on a new religion, so do you. Right. Mm. So that's part of what's going on. That's like a super simple thing. Yep. And so there's this feeling amongst some people that old fashioned levels of asceticism, which we know were going on, even in the life of Antony, Part of what he does before he becomes the first desert father is go and hang out with the local holy men back in his hometown. So you know that there are guys who are living a special separated life. 
Mm-hmm. But it's sort of like this retreat to the desert is part of this reaction to a perceived, on the part of some of the desert fathers, a perceived worldliness of what's going on in the great churches of the cities, but a love for them. They never stop praying for and loving the church of the cities. And if they get too prideful about how awesome they are living in the desert, some angel will come and give them a vision of a baker who is just living his ordinary life in Alexandria and is holier than he is. Huh. Right. Interesting. So, that yeah, is that's fascinating. I've, uh, I've brought this up uh, before, you know, in uh, Presbyterianism, we fence the table when we come to the Lord's table. And I've mentioned before, you know, that, I mean, this isn't like we used to fence the table, we being, you know, uh, those uh, in the first couple of centuries when it was, you know, uh, very much exclusive for the sake of like just maintaining uh, the church, right? I mean, in, in the midst of severe persecution or hostility, you understand how that would arise and then, you know, kind of slowly change. Um, and you can imagine just the the feeling of like just the world shifting nature of all of a sudden, like what we believe is well-known and even popular. Like that's, that's a really, uh, that would be a, quite the mind shift, right? If you're going through that. Um, and so you understand how somebody could easily come out the other side and, and think, no, they're like, we need some kind of extra discipline at this point. Um, that makes total sense to me. Mm. Yeah. I think it's, I think it is, I just think it's important context to have that part of this is developing out of this feeling of, of either some kind of downgrade or loss, but I, I, I really, I, I'd never heard this, that this very, that interesting addition you added that of these, purported reported visions of well don't you know these there are there are truly faithful christians yeah. and i think that that is yeah an important balance but all right so now that i think everyone will know kind of who they are where they were you can we will let's let's hear number two what is what is the second thing we should know about these gentlemen i think the second thing that you need to know about the desert fathers i was thinking about um a reformed listenership. That's right. That's who we are. Legacy. Mm. Because if they're, if the sole legacy of the desert fathers is to the Egyptian church or the Orthodox or the Roman Catholics, then what business do we Protestants have caring about what they have to say? Sure. Basically. I mean, that's not, there's an argument even against what I just said there, that just because something doesn't make its way into the reformation doesn't mean it's not worthwhile, but actually mm. there is a huge legacy of the desert fathers. So in Latin Christendom, right through the Reformation, um, through a few different channels. So one of the things um, is, first of all, there a lot of their teachings do get translated. So the sayings of the Desert Fathers, these sort of short little things where a guy comes to a monk and says, Father, give me a word. And so then the monk gives him some pithy statement um, or little, little, these little anecdotes about them. Hmm. These get translated into Latin. And so they're being read throughout the whole Middle Ages in the West. Um, that's one thing. And then there's this guy, John Cassian, who like lived with them for 10 years. And then around the year 400, a whole bunch of stuff went, just went crazy in the desert. And a whole bunch of guys ended up getting dispersed. And so he ultimately finds his way to, to Marseille and huh. starts a monastery there and writes down sort of his recollections. And so that also, and that is recommended reading for Benedictines by St. Benedict. He's like, he should read Cassian. Right, so like 100 years after Cassian is Benedict. And uh, but you're, and you're wondering, well, where's the flow to the Protestants is from Cassian to Benedict to St. Bernard and the Cistercians and St. Bernard to John Calvin. Calvin is a big fan of Bernard of Clairvaux. Everybody um, loves yep. Bernard, yeah, so, interesting. And so that means that the heart, what do I say? I say the heart of Cistercian spirituality, so not just Bernard, but really great guys like Ailred of Rivaux, William of St. Thierry, um, these guys, the heart of their um, spiritual life is being molded by texts out of the desert and seeking God in a similar mode, um, mm. just in the wilderness of the forests of France and England, instead of the wilderness of the Nile. So that I think, I think the, the desert fathers to Calvin trajectory is like one of the most important ones for us to keep in our minds. Um, when we think what relevance does this have for the Protestant faith is like, well, that is one thing. Um, and then another one is another trajectory that sort of 
probably has Cistercians as a stepping stone is to the late medieval thing called the Devotio Moderna. And one of its most famous exponents is St. Thomas Akempis, who wrote The Imitation of Christ, which is until the 20th century, at least, who knows, because we've had Rick Warren, right? So these <laughs> right. stats are skewed now. Before Rick Warren was the second most popular Christian book, the Bible always being number one, and mm -hmm. then The Imitation of Christ, read by Martin Luther, um, got a translation by John Wesley from the Latin into the English, but had an early English translation from around the, in the 16th century. And his has bears a lot of uh, the same wisdom as the Desert Fathers. So we can see their teachings are having at least an indirect legacy through St. Bernard and Thomas Akempis on the spirituality of the Reformation. Mm. And I think what the Reformation is actually doing with that inheritance is taking it from the monastery back to the ordinary church and saying, look, this is for all of us. The best things the monks can do are things that we too can do. Mm. And that's another thing that Greg Peters gets into in one of his books. Might be his book, The Story of Monasticism. I read, I read a bunch of his books right at the same time when I first met him. So, but, <laughs> so they blurred together as one. Yeah. Yep. Oh, I um, understand that. <laughs> so, but one of the things he points out is that Luther and Calvin have nothing against any of the individual disciplines that go on in monasteries. It is the, the primary one. I mean, besides the spiritual elitism that is inevitable, even in the Desert Fathers, is the lifelong vow. They say the only lifelong vow that the scripture allows is marriage. Mm. And so then, but if you want to be celibate for a period, why should we say no to that? You want to pray the entire book of Psalms in a whole day? Go for it. Yeah. You know, none of these <laughs> things as an individual discipline is bad for you. Mm. They're good for you. So yeah. go right ahead. Well, this is, this is really interesting for a few reasons. One, this kind of helps a person round out then why do all these kind of reform confessions have a section on vows? Because it's a, it's the specific thing they're correcting, right? That this is the thing they think yeah. we don't want to carry over. Two, the connection to Thomas Akempis is very interesting. RTS, where I am, uh, have been a student, still teaches the imitation of Christ as a text today uh, in their classics of personal devotion. That's so that, that's carrying on, which is great. But I, I, I'm really interested in this um, connection to Calvin. Is there, um, and it can just be something maybe in Bernard, is there one, is there a particular emphasis you can find in Bernard that you would say, this is, this is that, this is that legacy of the, fob, the desert fathers kind of carrying over? Is there one you could point out that would just maybe be interesting to hear? I would say the ability of the Christian soul, right? These, these guys, there's none of this modern spirituality. It's all Christian. Um, uh -huh. The ability of the Christian soul um, to find union with God. Because mm. um, that's what the Desert Fathers were after. And yeah. that's, um, that's what, at least, I mean, that's what the Puritans and Calvin are all after, right? Union with that's Christ right. is a big thing for John Owen as well. And this, I mean, I think it's a thing you can argue from scripture, like, so you could theoretically come to it independently of each other. Um, but it is, it's a big thing for Bernard. That's sort of the point of song, his commentaries on the Song of Songs. Mm, right. Um, which I realize have, like, Gregory of Nyssa and Origin um, walloping on them as well, besides the desert. Yeah. But. Oh, that's great. All right. Yeah, fascinating. L let's do number three. I'm, I'm ready. Number three. Number three is orthodoxy. Mm. Um, this is a this for me is one of the a big deal um, because you know I, like everyone I probably spend too much time on the internet and there are people out there on the internet from certain fringe elements within the Christian faith and and therefore as well as some core people who don't know the history as well as I do who want to claim that the desert fathers are like out there they're doing their own wild crazy thing and they feel like the church back in the city is too doctrinaire and that mm -hmm. the bishops shouldn't have this sole ability to determine dogma, that it should just mm. be like a, a free for all, man. Right. And, um, you know, maybe who knows? Cause there aren't actually, there are very few doctrinal statements on the hot issues of the day coming from the desert father. So there could be some desert father out there um, who's completely uh, like bonkers. And I mean, there are a few, there are some, theological skirmishes that go on around the year 400 with this these earliest generations but most of the time 
when the Desert Fathers have something to say on, say, the doctrine of the Trinity, which is like the hot topic of the fourth century, they're Trinitarian. They're hmm. anti-Aryan. Um, we have letters St. Anthony wrote in Coptic. Um, wow. And he's, and he's, he's pro-Athanasian. He's anti-Aryan. He's like, yep. Like he's in alliance with the Bishop of Alexandria. There is this one guy, Evagris, who like is a bit more cloudy and murky as to how orthodox he is or how unorthodox he is. But even his letter on the faith in terms of Trinitarian orthodoxy, he's within the bounds of the historic Christian faith. It's some of his other teachings that are a bit whack. Um, but even then he does, he wouldn't be, even his other teachings that are whack, he wouldn't be thinking like, the bishop shouldn't be allowed to tell me what to believe. Who does he think he is, right? That's mm. not the way, that's not the way a fourth century uh, monk would be thinking. Um, when they do tend to run into collisions with bishops, it's often power and bishops using, trying to use monks for their own worldly ends. Um, so Theophilus of Alexandria famously destroyed a temple called the Serapeion. Uh, the Serapeion was the last remnant of the Museon, which had been where the library was housed. Oh. This is not the same thing as burning the library, which happened in the 300, with, which happened in the third century under the Emperor Aurelian during a riot, which I think is, this is one of the few public times anyone has clarified that issue. Um, <laughs> wow. So not the same event. The library was already burnt down by accident, but it's not sexy to say that it was Aurelian accidentally burning it down. It's sexy to say it was Theophilus. So people yeah. do. Um, and the monks didn't like it. He, he like got them to come and destroy as, to be part of his um, de demolition crew. And they huh. didn't like it. And so they talk about with regret about that time the bishop called us to Alexandria and we tore down wow. this temple, but not like because they were getting their hands dirty because they were doing this thing because Theophilus was using them to do acts of violence, basically. Huh. So that's their sort of thing. They, they have a few clashes with Theophilus anyway, because he also creates a, he makes a statement that, that causes is actually like the instigator of all sorts of the crazy stuff that happens between 390 and the death of John Chrysostom in 407. Um, that he also succeeds in getting Chrysostom exiled and killed. So um, good guy. Uh, and so <laughs> we're like, yeah, Theophilus, great. Um, but what he makes this statement, there's all this pressure on him from different people trying to get him to choose one side in some of these monastic doctrinal um, issues. So he comes up with this anti-anthropomorphite statement saying that God doesn't have a, doesn't have a body like we do. Mm. And it is reported from sources that, well, how will we put them? Sources that would agree with such a statement that a bunch of the monks went, were like, well, what are we gonna do? Um, how we can't imagine God as a man, then what are we supposed to do with ourselves? Um, and so a bunch of the monks went to go and confront Theophilus. But what's interesting is with the Coptic sources about what the monks talked to Theophilus about are not talking about this, the heretical idea that God has a body like ours. Mm. They're talking to him about, um, they are afraid that he is compromising the full humanity of Christ. Mm. And so then that's, all of a sudden you realize that their, whatever he's arguing isn't what they're concerned about. Their concern is Jesus needs to have a body like ours. Otherwise, what is, how are we saved? And they thought he was transgressing that. But oh. all the Greek sources that are vaguely pro-Theophilus at that moment are telling us a different story from what the Copts, who are the target, are telling us. Not that there's, it's not like it's a, it's a very perme um, permeable thing between Copt and Greek, but that's sort of part of what's going on. So if you want to talk about their potential unorthodoxy, that's like the one main thing. And it turns out that maybe it's not what the sources are telling us anyway. Wow, interesting. So. Well what I love about what I love about doing the church history on this level is how textured and interesting, right. You know, yep. like that there, that there's a lot more than like, here are their sayings. And that's kind of what, you know, what I, I just, I appreciate that about, you know, any figure or, or time in church history, this, this very textured and, you know, obviously a uh, complex uh, thing. And obviously, cause it's so dip, di distant, it can feel foreign, but I think that mm -hmm. even these questions of orthodoxy, how do we define them? Who says, and what are the motivations going on? 
it, you know, is, is interesting mm-hmm. and relevant. Yeah. I was going to say, I love just what a mess it is, <laughs> you know, it's kind of encouraging, isn't it? Like, oh yeah. Like, okay. We've been here before when things just like everybody's talking past each other. Some people are heretics. Some people are called heretics. Some people you just don't know. Like, and it's just this like mess when you're getting into the details. Let me zoom back. You see, you know, how it uh, progresses and how God still builds his kingdom in the midst of it. And so I just, I find it uh, overall encouraging when we look into these things. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel the same way. I also do like church councils. You want to talk about things that are a mess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, but the, the, the providence of God guiding his church to articulate these important doctrines, even if the guys mm-hmm. who were doing it were sometimes sneaky. Yep. Um, right? They were real people, right? Like they were real yeah. people. They weren't like, it's not like this pristine, like look at church history, this perfect like movement from, you know, glory to glory. And, right. uh, and it is that in a sense, right? Um, the way that God intervenes and, and uh, works it that way, but it is still just this, it's just all over the place. And I love it. Yeah, that is great. All right, let's get to, what are we on? Are we on number four? Four, perfect. All right, I'm, I can count everybody. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is why Calvinists have to limit everything to five, by the That's way. Right. We, we start to lose it after that. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say once you sort of know who on earth these guys are, where they are, right? These guys in you know, fourth, fifth, sixth century Egypt, Syria, Palestine, and why they're why they're in and that they're influential, perhaps, and why they're influential in our own tradition, and that they're not a bunch of heretics, then you can I feel like that makes you ready uncomfortable to pick up one of their books even though it might be whack by the time you're done it and then what you need to know is that prayer is their raison d'etre prayer Mm -hmm. is the entire reason they're there Mm -hmm. Um, ultimately what they are seeking is pure prayer they want to make their lives a living prayer they want to they take seriously saint paul um saying um just pray pray without ceasing they say all right we'll pray without ceasing how do we do that? Mm. And so they, every, like most of the things that they do are attempts to focus their minds on prayer as much as possible. Uh, but they also realize that still being humans, they do need to do things in order to survive. And so then there's this interesting balance between, okay, well, what do you do when you need to eat? How, how, do you, how does that count as prayer? And so they have different solutions to the problem of the fact that you're eating. Um, so when you live in community, one of the things you do is you don't talk. This is carries on to the Benedictines, um, Carthusians, and everyone else. You don't talk while you eat. You have one guy reading. And so you listening to what he's reading, he reads the Bible or mm. some other holy text. That counts as prayer. So you're not eating. You're not having jovial conversation with the other monks. You're busy listening to someone um, edify you. That counts as prayer. Or one monk, you know, a lot of these guys are hermits, so they don't have that option. Um, one of the monks, he says, well, I always um, leave something for the poor. And I just imagine that their prayers of thankfulness of what I've given to them will count for my prayers when I am sleeping and eating. Right. So how do you do it? You enlist the prayers of others to cover you when you literally cannot be praying. Mm. So they're sort of, that is it. And so they have all these um, sayings. Um, One of the famous ones is, I can't remember who is, I think it's Abba John goes to Abba Isaiah and says, um, Father, I, I eat um, once a day, I keep vigils every week, and I pray, um, I pray the Psalter, um, what else could I do? And then Abba Isaiah of Scatus lifted his hands up to the heavens, they became like, and his fingers became like 10 candles, and he said, if you would, you would become all flame, which is evocative, and I honestly don't quite know what it means, but it's one of these things that everyone quotes. <laughs> um, so I thought I'd bring it to your podcast. It sounds, it sounds cool. What, yeah. what, you know, it does. It sounds very cool. And, so, and these were the kinds of things that I'm sure my friend read and went, what could that <laughs> mean? I think, uh, so. but I really do think a huge value would be if, if there's anything we can learn from them is, is, thinking through how to pray the Psalter, right? How do we, you know, how can we, you know, even up that's that I think is, there's a lot of questions, right? This life of prayer, 
should, you know, should cause us to ask, should cause us to wonder about what that would mean for us in our hurried, you know, uh, lives. But I think even on a very practical level, the, the devotion the Desert Fathers and all the monks had, you know, to Luther as a monk, had to the Psalter, I think is, is a, is a huge, is a huge corrective to our Mm. hurried, hurried day. Yeah. Even just the discipline, just imagining, you know, the discipline to pray the entire Psalter every day. I just, that's hard for me to imagine, right? Like that's, uh, like, that's just uh, very uh, striking. And I am supposed to be a minister, you know, like I'm a, yeah. I'm a pastor and that is hard for me to understand. So that's, I mean, that's convicting. Yeah, it is. Um, the idea and during, doing the entire Psalter a day is pretty, pretty difficult. It's more common. They do 12 Psalms a day. Mm. So um, in the, there's a text called the rule of the angel, which was allegedly given to Pacomius by an angel one day. And uh, so these are the 12 Psalms to do in such and such an order. And so then the, that becomes like the main tradition, but this is the heart of their prayer life. And this is something that I think a lot of our churches today have lost that mm. actually the early reformation um, was very keen on. And I actually had the blessing when I was in Edinburgh, I was a member of the free church of Scotland. So there's my reformed credentials should have thrown yep. that in at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> Because you don't really get a lot more reformed in the English speaking world. Not the really. Church. It's hard. Yeah. Um, it's really hard to be more reformed than the We Freeze. And yeah. when I started, um, yeah, so it's just a cappella songs. Mm-hmm. It, I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to say, even as a person who loves hymnody, I'm a little disappointed that they've moved away from, they still do uh, at least two at our church, two a cappella songs every Sunday, but they've like added some like, you know, musical instruments and hymns. Um, but initially, it was just like you had a presenter up the front leading you in singing psalms and it was actually great and it is actually when there would they would have joint services for from everyone in the presbytery of edinburgh would come together in one church Mm -hmm. and so then these churches that in 1847 were packed to the gills because like most people left the church of scotland um and now they're not quite so full to finally get one of them with the gallery is packed full and the ground floor is full and there are people there who know the harmonies and you're all singing the praises of God yeah. in God's own words from the book of Psalms together. It's actually one of the, my, my favorite worship experiences were yeah, that's amazing. Services of the free church of Scotland. That is, that's incredible. I love it. I love the idea of it. <laughs> you know, I love, I, I would I'd love to just be in a room. We've talked in the past about, you know, times you, you get together, for instance, you know, at uh, the Presbyterian Church in America, where I'm a pastor, we had our general assembly recently. And so you get a room full of, you know, I don't know, there was like, there was supposedly 2,300, you know, elders registered, but then add in, you know, women, children, things like that for, uh, and, you know, sponsors and those sorts of things for the, uh, uh, the worship services. And, you know, I mean, this is a, this is a solid 4,000 people at least and all singing together. Um, and it was great, you know, just to have everybody there and there, they actually, they had a whole, uh, whole orchestra set to, uh, play. And that was just something else, but do you have a room packed full, uh, doing acapella songs, people know the various parts. Um, even that is not something that you have very often anymore. So, um, it just sounds beautiful. Yeah. And that it would have been something, well, it would have been a late antique version of that at like the weekly gathering. So there are actually no perfect, well, there's no such thing as a perfect hermit. Um, And even there's no absolute hermits either, very rarely. Um, Most of them live within walking distance of at least one other guy. And usually they can create communities that in sort of later monastic terms, well, fifth century monastic, that's not, that's still Desert Fathers, I guess. Anyway, um, would be called a lavra. And a lavra is a, is a, is like a federation of hermitages that has a chapel in walking distance of every hermit. Wow. And so then they go every Saturday night, they would go to the chapel and sing Psalms together. And every Sunday morning, they would have a minister. One of the monks would be an ordained minister who would be there to do the Holy Communion. Wow. Well, let's go to number five to make sure, uh, 
we have a little chance for bonus to put you on the spot about Athanasius after this. So, but <laughs> let's go. Let's hear number five. This is this is great. Number five is the desert devotion to scripture, mm. um, to the word. And this is in an important way uh, at the heart of their life. It is at the heart of their prayer. We've actually, I mean, we've basically drifting there from talking about, they go from prayer and there are all sorts of things to say about prayer and wordless prayer and reaching beyond um, these things. But the heart of it, the core of that is the Psalms. And so then the Psalms and sacred scripture, these are what are the most important things um, to them. So to take us to Antony again, one of the most famous stories about him is how he, how he became a monk. He went to church one day and there uh, the text being read out loud in church was Matthew 19, 21. Um, if you would be perfect, go sell all you have, then come and follow me. And he said, well, that's it then. And so Antony just left. Um, he sold, gave to the poor, um, put his sister in a nunnery. I'm not always sure about that step when you have like the legal guardianship of another human to decide their fate. And I mean, as long as she's not bound to become a nun by the time she reaches the age of majority, I guess she's taken <laughs> care of by the nuns. Um, but yeah, puts his sister in a nunnery and then goes off and finds the local holy man um, to begin his training. Scripture is sort of, is pushing them. And one of the driving ideas that they have is if you're not doing it, you're not interpreting scripture correctly. Mm. that you imitate the words of scripture and yeah. that is that shows that you are interpreting the words of scripture mm. so one of my favorite stories another of my uh, there's so many great stories one of them is the story of abba pombo this is in the coptic life of abba pombo one of the other sort of fourth century guys and when he first sh shows up at the monastery he sort of goes to one of the elders and he says father uh, i wish to learn the psalms he says, oh, let us begin with Psalm 8. Psalm 8 says, I guarded my tongue. This is the first verse. says, I guarded my tongue so that it would speak no ill word. And Abba Pombo says, thank you. I will learn this. And then he leaves. And the, the elder who had taught it to him was expecting him to go off and practice the singing and chanting of the psalm. And he was actually a bit surprised that Abba Pombo left after only one verse. He was going to teach him how to sing the whole psalm and memorize it by heart. Right? And they probably would have actually had, because a lot of these guys are illiterate. Mm -hmm. um, so this is my aside from the Coptic life. But what, what he's expecting is, I sing it to you, you sing it back until we can sing the whole psalm back and forth, which is, once again, actually what the Reformed um, tradition would do with the presenter back right. before literacy. Yeah. You can't have a hymnal if you can't, well, who cares if I can't read it? Um, and they still actually do that back and forth in some of the Gallic churches. Um, so anyway, so, but Pombo goes off and disappears. And he disappears for a year. And finally comes back to the elder and he says, Father, I'm sorry, I've, I've been unable to learn Psalm 8, verse 1, because I do not find myself capable to control my tongue. Mm. And sort of that encapsulates their entire approach to the yeah. Bible is that who cares if you can, who cares if you know Greek and Hebrew and can interpret the words of scripture at a linguistic level, if you can't live them, then your mm. interpretation is meaningless. Mm. Yeah, this is something uh, that, you know, I've, so I'm, you know, I'm not that, again, familiar with the Desert Fathers. I'm, you know, the most familiar I am, I guess, is a, a little bit through, you know, kind of uh, just really just a biography on St. Athanasius. But um, on this, um, in On the Incarnation by St. Athanasius, at the very end, um, it's like some of the last, you know, couple of paragraphs, I believe, uh, leading up to the end, one of the things that Athanasius says is, uh, you know, if you would like to learn the scriptures like the fathers, you know, the fathers to him, uh, he says, then you need to imitate their life. And I've been so struck by that um, being in the time that we're in that is so very often rationalistic um, in the way that we approach scripture where we think, yes, if I just have this, you know, if I just, if I just know exactly, you know, uh, from a grammatical historical approach, what this means, um, that's, that is interpretation. And that is how I really get to know, um, what God is saying in his word. And from this approach, you can have an atheist who knows the scriptures. Um, but th it's not just that, right. There, there's an element of that, right. There are things you can know, uh, but this is also 
a, a spiritual book, right? Because God himself is speaking through it by his spirit. And um, he himself has inspired these words. And so to hear that um, was very striking to me many years ago when I first read on the incarnation. And uh, I like, I haven't, in a sense, I haven't stopped thinking about it. I mean, it's, it's on my mind very regularly. Yeah. That actually, that reminds me of when I was, uh, I spent a year working for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, seconded to the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, and I was on the island of Cyprus. So while I was there, I was doing some of my Desert Fathers stuff for personal um, edification, as well as reading, there's this um, big Greek collection put together in the early modern period called the Philokalia, which is super popular with the Orthodox. So I was reading that because I was surrounded by Orthodox. But at the same time as that, I was doing my, um, you know, good evangelical thing. And I was taking this, a module from a international seminary who shall remain nameless, um, a introduction to the Bible kind of thing. And one of the things that they said several times was any atheist or pagan should be able to read the scripture using these methods. They will come to the true conclusions about what the Bible is all about. And there I'm reading that on the one hand coming from my own, this is like times when you find your own tradition is being challenged. And then I'm reading these, you know, monks who have been dead for 1500, 1600 years saying no pagan will ever be able to interpret scripture because they're not worshiping God. And so yeah. then they can't and wow. like, Whoa. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Wow. And, and it is so self-evidently true. <laughs> Right, their their position is so self evidently true in the in the world of the scripture. So, I'll ask one more question. Um, you know, I think if you found this interesting, uh, you would do great to look into the class because, again, with uh, historical topics like this, it can be so hard to get into them without a guide. And I think Matt at Davenant Hall would be great at that. Let me ask this question for our listeners who may, like me, be a little bit of a church history buff, right? I'm no expert. I, you know, I, I dabble in these things. How come for them, the only thing they've heard about the church fathers, if, you know, up until now is, right, you have, you've painted a picture of, you know, where they fall in church history before and after, right? Their dedication to the scriptures, their dedication to the prayer. And obviously there are things they say you know, because they're, they're so different than us that we don't, we've even said, I don't really know what to do with that. Right. We, you know, they, we don't, we're not trying to, you're not, and you haven't tried to paint them into an, uh, uh, into like, they're like, they're, they think just like you, right. There are things that would be strange to them and strange to us, but how come for most people, the one thing we knew about them before now is, well, they were the guys, some of them, some of them are the guys who sat on those pillars and wouldn't get down. Right. How, how come there's this such this great divergence in in often what is known about these uh, these times in church history? I don't know. It's just a thing that has been on my mind as I've gotten to hear you talk about them. I think one of the reasons why. So you bring up like so Saint Simeon the Stylite. That's right. Yeah. Um, and Saint Daniel the Stylite. Saint Simeon the Stylite the Younger. Um, and there's some Stylite living in Georgia right now. Oh, really? Georgia, okay. the country. I was, I realized I was, I have to say that every time. Anyway. Yep. Um, so in case you're wondering, a stylite <laughs> is a, uh, is a monk who sits on a pillar that this is kind of where he is uh, yeah. as, as much as he can. People bring him food so that he can stay up there basically. Yeah. So it's a particularly, uh, I was talking about, there's like this division between Syria and Egypt. It's a, they tend to be Syrian. Um, yeah. And, uh, but yeah, so we tend to hear that. I think there, there are a few different forces at play as to why things like Simeon on his pillar tend to be more popular or stories about the guy swimming the Nile and crocodile. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know who, who besides me has heard that and other scholars who read these things for work. Mm -hmm. um, but why the wild stories, the stuff that's whack uh, tend to dominate discourses, partly because they're more fun to tell for one thing. Yeah. They're it's interesting. <laughs> right. So it's like, it's like, or even like, it's, it's more fun even to tell the story of um, everything from Theophilus with his anti-anthropomorphite statement through to the, like this explosion of monks being expelled from monasteries and how this whole series of events engulfs John Chrysostom. 
right? That's way more interesting than saying, um, well, Abba Macarius sat in his cell and prayed day after day. Like, no one wants to hear that story. <laughs> that, but that's the story. That's, that's the real story of the Desert Fathers is Abba Macarius sitting in his cell, praying day after day and wrestling with demons. So, of course, wrestling with demons is the other thing. Um, so I think, A, it's way more interesting to the modern mind to hear stories about crazy things. B, I think they're also, because those are the, these sorts of things are things that are harder for us to assimilate and take seriously as important representations of our own faith. I think there is an unspoken, now this is, this is like conjecture, but both Protestants and modernists sometimes have a felt need to discredit older Christianity because at some point everything has to have gone wrong for us to need a reformation or if you're an atheist just Christianity is stupid to begin with well obviously the sophisticated atheists wouldn't call us stupid you just call us wrong but it's wrong to begin with therefore you're going to look for things and you're going to highlight those in your books so well, this is one of the things someone pointed out E.R. Dodds um, in his book about pagans and Christians was a pagan and Christian in an age of anxiety. He all of his stuff about the Desert Fathers comes from like basically one source. That's one of those ones that's obsessed with these kinds of stories. All these much more normal, toned down things aren't part of his narrative because that narr the narrative of boring monks praying serves it does not serve the modernist agenda, whether it's Protestant or anti-Protestant. I don't even know what Dodds's own religious position was on anything. Um, so, but it was clear that he was not fond of the Desert Fathers. Um, and so he says, where does all this madness come from? And well, yeah, why, I mean, yeah, why do guys wear um, vests made out of iron under their clothes? That's a good question, I guess. But that's not what the majority of these guys are doing. Again, mm -hmm. that guy was from Syria. Yeah, I do think, I do think it's important for, pro you know, uh, protestants and the reformed right i made a joke at the beginning of this podcast about well how would anyone know about this since the church began with billy graham but the yeah. <laughs> the very precise argument that the reformers that the early reformers were making was not that church history has been lost since the apostles but that that in the last hundred years they had seen the corruption of the church and mm -hmm. it needed to be reformed of course according to the scriptures it wasn't that we need to discount the last 1400 years. It's that something has went so wrong in the last hundred. Right. And so I think that of course we, we should um, whether, you know, what take whatever caution you need to not ride on crocodiles or sit on pillars or, you know, try and. If you can ride on crocodiles, I'm not okay. like against admittedly, it. Admittedly, <laughs> admittedly, if someone has a way to help me ride on a crocodile, I would take that. But, but that this, that, that, that kind of attitude is actually not what the Reformation was about. And I think that just thinking through and having people from a very different time in a very different place, but with the scriptures seeking to worship God is a great challenge to the kinds of these kinds of rationalistic things we've talked about, things that we take for granted that would have been foreign to their experience. And so thanks Matt for coming on and sharing with us the five things we, um, we should learn about the desert fathers. I hope some people will join you in your class. Is there is there anywhere you want to point people to find you online? If not, that's okay. And they can just uh, uh, go to the Davenant Hall website. Um, you can find me on Twitter at MJJ Hoskin. And that sort of, I do tend to funnel. I'm also on YouTube and I have a blog, but I funnel YouTube videos and blog posts through Twitter. So it's like your one-stop shop um, where you can find me is there. Great. So we hope everyone listening will will link to his Twitter that everyone listening will at least begin following Matt on Twitter. So everybody, Thank thanks, Matt, for joining us. And we will yes, be back with me. more Restless Summer next week. Thanks very much. Cool. Thank you again to Matt. Thank you for the Davenant Hall for connecting us with him. You can go check out his class on the Davenant Hall website. 
Uh, it's been a great restless summer so far. Pastor Michael is on vacation right now, so shout him out. And we will see what we're doing next week. I think we're out of interviews, so let's get back to Restless. Later.